Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much, y'all, for coming. Don't feel like you have to be in the back. You can sit up in the front. Uh, listen, welcome, everyone, to Inspire Frisco. And if this is your first time here tonight, just want to make sure you know what Inspire Frisco is. Uh, we're an initiative, a collaboration between Mayor Cheney and the Frisco EDC and University of North Texas. Uh, as you know, University of North Texas is building a 100-acre 100, 100 campus here in Frisco. We're very excited about the partnership with them in many capacities. But Inspire Frisco is all about creating an innovation economy here in Frisco. We want, our goal is to keep Texas money in Texas. How about that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's keep, and let's keep Texas innovation in Texas. Um, yeah, we don't want it to be going to the coast all the time. Uh, we want to bring together our two greatest assets. You know what those are? Those are our people and our money. That's what we want to bring together so that we can do great things together, and that's what Inspire Frisco is about. So just to kind of let you know what's going to happen tonight, um, next we have the Frisco EDC president, Ron Patterson. So happy to have him. He's our special guest. He's going to come up and say a few words about Inspire Frisco and, and the city of Frisco. And then after that, um, I'm going to bring up Steve G. He's going to introduce our special speaker, Don Tapscott. So that's what's going to happen. And um, anyway, if Ron, if you'd like to come on up. Thank you very much. Well, we're so glad to have you here this, uh, this evening and just tell you that we're very, very excited about this opportunity. You know, one of the things that uh, every city kind of has a little tagline, you know, and you've always heard and a lot of cities use it, you know, we want to be live, work, play, right? But we've actually added on to that a little bit. We want to be live, work, play, but ours is live, work, play, educate, and innovate, especially as we are partnering with University of North Texas and, you know, Tier 1 Research Institute and also partnering with our school district as well as our Collin College. I mean, the list just goes on to be able to have these educational opportunities. Because one of the biggest things we've got out there right now is we've got to have a workforce pipeline, right? I mean, you've got to have the talent to be able to put those people to work and be able to have those opportunities to engage. So we're very, very excited about that. Also, so excited to hear about what went on here today. If you're not aware, there were uh, 12 <clears throat> universities here today. Uh, there were 45 companies, and Michael, if I get off my numbers here, you correct me, but I believe there were 45 companies here and five venture capitalists. So that makes a group of 50 that connected with universities, and we have heard some remarkable responses already. So we're very, very excited about that, the fact that we are actually making engagements and connections. So thank all of you and your efforts to be able to make that happen today. Uh, with regard to our IF talks, uh, these actually just started in uh, November of last year. So the process is still growing and it's developing. And I got to tell you, it's very exciting to see this group here this evening and also just know that we continue to grow and also want to continue to support these efforts. You know, the Inspire Frisco, our IF talks, are something that we're very, very proud of. And again, I would like to also mention Lori and her efforts to be able to work in this space as well. So thank you very much. Uh, lastly, uh, you know, as she touched on, you know, the idea of creating an innovation economy is very, very important to us. And this process is a big piece of that. And having someone like uh, Don Tapscott here this evening to talk is an incredible piece of that. Uh, someone who is a brilliant mind uh, in this space, and so we are very privileged to have him. Lastly, I'll just say welcome. We're glad to have you here. I hope you enjoy this evening, and I hope you have a great time. I'm going to turn it back over to Lori. Thank you. So we have someone actually very special that is, I have to stand up because I'm so short, right? Uh, we have someone actually very special, just it's going to introduce our keynote speaker, Don Tapscott. It's Steve G. That's what he goes by. And um, Steve has just an incredible resume and in what he has done in his life and still doing and accomplishing. Um, he has been such an innovator in so many different capacities, whether it be working in the university, working in the private sector, or even working with 
with nonprofits. Uh, he was one of the founders of BSG in the 80s, co-founder of App, AppConomy, now Moxie Software, managing director of Broadbrush Ventures, um, recently was the executive director of Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at University of Texas Dallas, and now is working special projects. Um, so maybe he'll tell us more. So uh, Steve also works with our friends at Capital Factory, and it's through that relationship with Capital Factory that uh, Steve was able to work to bring our keynote speaker, Don Tapscott, here. So again, we thank them both very much for coming. And so Don is going to speak, and then at the end, we're going to open it up for Q&A. And so our very own Mike Rondelli, of course, will run the Q&A, and then he'll close us out. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Lori. Well, I'm tall, but I'm going to stand on the stage, too. <laughs> so I'm Steve Genrich. Some people want to know what the G stands for. And I'm a senior advisor with the Office of Research at the University of Texas at Dallas. And until recently, as Lori mentioned, I served as the executive director of UT Dallas's Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I bring you greetings from Dr. Joe Pancrazio, VP of Research at UT Dallas, as well as my colleagues from our Office of Technology Commercialization, one of the groups that Ron mentioned were here today, whom I hope you had a chance if you were here earlier to meet or say hello to this afternoon. Innovation and entrepreneurship aren't just nouns in North Texas. Our sister institutions know whether the UT system, like UT Southwestern and UT Arlington, or whether the, the other great public and private institutions here in our region, we know that innovation and entrepreneurship are verbs as well. We don't just talk about them, we do them. We innovate, we start up new ventures, we discover and then prove the foundation for new products and services in our world. Case in point being the lithium ion battery innovations by Dr. John Goodenough of UT Austin and his colleagues who were just awarded this year's Nobel Prize for Chemistry today. And so it's my pleasure on behalf of UT Dallas to bring to you today's speaker. Don Tapscott is one of the world's leading authorities on the impact of technology innovations on business and society. He has authored 16 books, including Wikonomics, How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything, which has been translated into over 25 languages. Don's most recent and ambitious book was co-authored with his son, Alex Tapscott, a globally recognized investor, advisor, and speaker on blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies, and who, by the way, is a distinguished visiting scholar and adjunct professor with UT Dallas. Blockchain Revolution, that book, How the Technology Behind Bitcoin and Other Cryptocurrencies is Changing the World, was published in May 2016 and is according to Harvard Business School's Clay Christensen, the book, literally, on how to survive and thrive in this next wave of technology-driven disruption. Now, my personal history with Don goes back more than 35 years when I was a 23-year-old newbie consultant with Arthur Anderson and serving as a series editor for Don and the other speakers who submitted papers for the proceedings of the 1983 Office Automation Conference in Houston. Remember that one, Don? <laughs> That's when the biggest name in disruptive computing was Wang. Okay, for any of you out there who are as old as me. So little did I know that that speaker, Don, still in his early career, would be frequent frequently invited guest of the annual World Economic Forum in Davos, briefing the globe's business and national leaders, from Jeff Bezos to Jack Ma, from Angela Merkel to Justin Trudeau. But here he is today for us, all the way from Davos to Frisco. <laughs> Please join me in a big North Texas welcome for my colleague and friend, Don Tapsko. Thanks very much. Oh, I have to turn this thing on, don't I? Who's got the mic? I have to turn, oh, there we go. Okay. I was going to ask if there's a teenager in the house who can um, <laughs> help me out. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I really mean that. Um, I had a really interesting afternoon. I toured the Star uh, with the mayor uh, of Frisco, 
And um, that's an extraordinary facility. Um, and uh, well, and as you all well know, there's nothing like it really uh, in the world. I, probably not in any sport. And um, it's sort of, uh, it was emblematic to me about all the excitement that's going on generally in this area. I'm a big believer in innovation and Canada, where I'm from, and Texas actually <laughs> have a similarity. We're both oil-based economies and resource-based economies, and we do need to move to become innovation economies. So the topic here today, how do you innovate? How do you build a, an ecosystem? And how do you get a good collaboration and transfer of ideas from a university into entrepreneurship is a very uh, important one. And what I'd like to try and convince you of in the next few minutes, I'm not gonna give my usual eight hour speech, um, <laughs> is that the digital age is entering the second era. And the first era was based in Silicon Valley. The second era will not be based there. And the jury is out as to where the global centers will be. And uh, it really comes down to a question of leadership. And leaders of old paradigms have difficulty embracing the new one word, Wang. Uh, Wang was one of a dozen mini computers, including Digital Equipment Corporation, which was the, almost the largest computer company in the world. And they're all gone, just like the mainframe companies, the bunch, remember them? Burroughs, Univac, NCR, Control Data, and Honeywell. These were all the big computer companies when I was a kid. And, um, and the mini computer companies are gone. Then the PC companies, remember the IBM PC? They're pretty much gone. So how do you find the leadership to make something like this happen? Well, in some ways, I'm preaching to the converted. I think I'm also preaching to some diehards. It's 5.30 in the afternoon, and you're all sitting here listening to a lecture. Um, but um, I will uh, try and be uh, fairly brief about this. So just uh, going back to Steve's, um, I actually didn't know it was back that far. Uh, I did write a couple of books in the 1980s that nobody read, um, although apparently Steve did. Um, but I think my mother bought most of the copies, actually. But then I wrote my first bestseller, uh, Paradigm Shift, sorry about that, uh, in 93, and then The Digital Economy in 94. And that was the first bestseller about the web. And 20 years later, I was asked to write a 20th anniversary edition of the digital economy. And I had to reflect on what had occurred. And the book held up pretty well, quite well, actually. Um, there's a chapter in there about how television and the media will be transformed and uh, pretty much <clears throat> nailed it. <laughs> it was called, I didn't say the word Netflix, but <laughs> I described it. Prime time will become any time, stuff like that. But I had to think about, well, if that's what we've had for the last few decades, where are we going? And I found myself concluding that the digital age is really entering a second era. Um, we went through that whole mainframe, mini PC, the internet, the web, social media, the cloud, mobile uh, uh, media, big data. And now technology is infusing itself into everything, into the physical world. We have technologies that do things that they weren't programmed to do, machine learning and AI. Uh, because they're capable of learning and reprogramming themselves. Autonomous vehicles will dominate these streets, not in 50 years, but in 10 to 15 years. And uh, I know Frisco is already a leader in that regard. And uh, many other exciting technologies. And uh, I, surprisingly to me, I came to the conclusion that the foundational technology for all of this was not AI, but it was the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies, blockchain, blockchain. Now let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, would you put up your hand in one of these four categories? Number one, what's a blockchain? Number two, 
I know a little bit, but don't ask me up here to explain it. Number three, I'm pretty knowledgeable. Number four, this is my world, okay? Number one, what's a blockchain? Okay, number two, I know a little bit. Okay, that's most of you. Number three, I'm pretty knowledgeable. Okay, number four, this is my world. Okay, a few people. Oh, the front row, all right. Um, another question. Um, where, where, what sector are you from? Uh, who here is from the university? Anybody? Okay, all at the back. Um, venture capitalist, investor, uh, entrepreneur, uh, government. You work for other, uh, a company, okay. Did I miss anybody? Okay, who didn't put up their hand? How about that one? <laughs> um, okay, good. Well, th this is a great, uh, great group and a great cross section. So, to me, blockchain is the operating platform for the 21st century enterprise and economy. And most communities get AI and the importance of AI. They don't get blockchain. And this is a real competitive differentiator, and I'd like to try and convince you of that. And to me, in many ways, it's the second era of the internet. So for the first era, 40 years, and I go back to Bell Labs in the 70s, we've had this internet of information. But if I send you some information, for example, I don't know, if I send you a PDF of this deck or an email, I'm actually not sending you the information, I'm sending you a copy. Even with a website, I keep the original, and that works fine for information. But when it comes to assets, things that really matter to an economy and to a community and society, things like money or intellectual property or uh, security, stocks, bonds, so on, uh, deeds, contracts, loyalty points, carbon credits, um, the data in our identities, even cultural assets like art or music, Vote, a vote is an asset, something of value that belongs to somebody. When it comes to assets that make the economy work, copying them is a really bad idea. You don't want someone copying your vote or your identity. And if I send you $1,000, it's really important that I don't still have the money, right? Copying money is a bad idea. So for decades, Crypto cryptographers have called this the double spend problem, and no one had been able to crack it. So the way that we manage this problem in our economy is through intermediaries, banks, stock markets, governments, credit card companies, um, social media companies, others, perform all of the business and transaction logic of every type of commerce. They identify the party you are, who you are, they identify the asset, that's a dollar, or that's a, a, a bond or whatever. They clear and settle transactions, they keep records, they enable us to trust each other in business and in commerce and in wealth creation. And overall, they've done a pretty good job, but there are growing problems. Number one is they're all based on central systems that, or servers, and that means that they can be hacked. And um, any, any central system can be hacked. J.P. Morgan, uh, Home Depot, the CIA found, out, uh, found that out the hard way. But there are other problems, too. If you look at one subset of these um, intermediaries, the banks, let's take Wall Street, they almost brought down the global capital system in 2008. I don't know if you remember where you are basically 11 years ago. I was on the stage at Cybos giving the closing talk. And three days earlier, Lehman Brothers had crashed. There were 9,000 people in the room. Actually, there were about 7,000 because you can see a bunch of empty seats on the right because 2,000 people lost their jobs in the last the three days prior to that. And I, I put away my PowerPoint. It was probably a good thing. I mean, power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. <laughs> but, um, but, and I, I made a critique of the banking system, but we kind of knew some of the problems, but we didn't really have a clear sort of solution. But there are other problems too. I mean, 
the banks exclude a couple of billion people from the global economy. Now, in fairness to them, it's not just that these people are not profitable as customers because they don't have any money. Uh, they, most of them don't have an identity either. But they also slow things down. I mean, why does it take four to seven days for uh, a housekeeper in um, Dallas to send her remittances back to her mom in the Philippines, in Manila. It's, it's called the diaspora. People have left their ancestral lands. They send money back home. It's a trillion dollars a year, almost. Why is she charged 10 to 20% by Western Union? Um, <clears throat> so they charge too much. And the, and the biggest problem to me is that we create all this data. They capture it. They monetize it. Uh, we can't use it to plan our lives, and our privacy is being undermined. So our, our, our virtual identities have been taken away from us, and we need to get them back so that we can manage them responsibly for ourselves. So there are growing problems. What if, what if there were not just an internet of information, what if there were an internet of value? some kind of vast, global, distributed ledger where anything of value, from money to stocks to art to the data in our identities could be managed or transacted in a secure and private way, peer to peer. Well, that's where Bitcoin comes in. 2008, this unknown, unnamed person, or person, Satoshi Nakamoto, wrote a paper solving the double spend problem. And this was the biggest innovation in computer science in a generation for me. And the reason it was so important is because for the first time ever, people and organizations could trust each other in a way that trust was not achieved by an intermediary. It was achieved by cryptography, by collaboration, and some clever code which is why Alex and I call it the trust protocol. It's a, it's a native digital medium for trust. So we've never had anything like this in, in, in human history, except if you go way back to primitive societies where there were no intermediaries. You just knew that that, that person was somebody who you could do business with. So at this point, most of you put up your hands in uh, group number one and two. So. You're probably wondering, well, just a second, Don. How is that possible? How is it possible I can send, say, some money from my mobile device to your mobile device directly, and there's no bank, there's no clearinghouse, there's no settlement uh, or organizations, there are no intermediaries of any kind, and you have 100% certainty that you now have the money and that I no longer do. How is that possible? Well, Mark Twain, he, he wrote a, f a letter to a friend. He says, I'm sorry I wrote such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short letter. And uh, it's taken, <laughs> took me and Alex three years to be able to describe how a blockchain works in three minutes. So set your timer. I'm going to tell you how a blockchain works. And um, the one I've chosen, because there are now hundreds of viable blockchains. The one I've chosen is Bitcoin, because it was the first one. But different ones have different mechanisms, but this was the, the first up. OK, you ready? All right, here we go. Oops, what happened there? Oh, I see, we're going, we should go forwards, right? Forward. All right, that $1,000 that I paid you is sent out to a global network uh, millions of computers, each using the highest level of cryptography. And all around the world is a subset of these people called miners, not like young people, like gold miners. And these miners do a lot of work with this massive computing power, estimated to be 20 to 50 times bigger than all of Google's servers in the world. It's the biggest computing resource in the world. And the miners use their computing power to compete 
to validate the transaction. And every 10 minutes, sort of like the heartbeat of the network, a block gets created. And that block contains all the transactions from the last 10 minutes. The fact that I sent $1,000. But it ultimately can be the fact that two people got married or a deed was registered or, or, or uh, some smart contract was uh, executed or a light bulb bought some power from a distributed power source, any transaction. And then the miners compete to validate the block and the winning miner gets paid some of the cryptocurrency from that block. They're rewarded for using their computing power to validate the block. And then, and this is the important part, that block gets connected to the previous block with a digital wax seal. And it's only valid if it references the previous block and the previous block. So if I wanted to hack that block and take that $1,000 and use it to pay somebody else and somebody else, if I wanted to commit fraud, I'd have to hack that block plus the previous, I'd have to hack every transaction that ever occurred on that blockchain, not just on one computer using the highest level of cryptography, which is tough to do, but across millions of computers all around the world simultaneously, each of them using the highest level of encryption. Now, I'm not going to say that's impossible to hack, but it's infinitely more secure than the computer systems we have running in our organizations today. Now, some of you may know, I had this really, that's the end. Some of you may know I had this really cool analogy on why that was so hard to hack, but I don't use it anymore because John Oliver on late night TV had some fun with my analogy. The process the network uses to verify records, it is very secure. Now, relax, I'm not gonna get into what that process is, or how it works, but I will share a really helpful, really dumb metaphor for why it is safe. The way I like to think of it is that a, a blockchain is a highly processed thing, sort of like a chicken McNugget. And if you wanted to hack it, it'd be like turning a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Now, someday someone will be able to do that, but for now, it's going to be Hold on, that is an absolutely horrible thought. So why is that reporter so happy about the idea? Because if anyone ever figures out how to turn a chicken McNugget back into a chicken, that chicken is going to be up. He's going to spend the rest of his life suffering from PTSD and writing haunting poetry about the experience. The things I saw, buck, buck, buck all. My body is whole, but what of my soul? <laughs> So, so I don't use the analogy anymore. I still think it's a good analogy, though. So Bitcoin was the first app of the Internet of Value. Do you remember the first app of the inter Internet of Information? It started like oh, 35 years ago, way before the web. It was email. And then... We saw the rise of the web in the early 90s, and there was a general purpose platform for building any app. And that's what these new blockchains are. They're not a single app, they enable you to build any app. So something like Hyperledger from the Linux Foundation, backed by IBM, Ethereum, created by a 19-year-old dropout from Toronto. Um, it's worth $20 billion today. Um, R3 Corda has 160 banks all building a next generation payment system. That'd be kind of cool. Today, you tap your card um, at, at Starbucks and a bunch of messages go through half a dozen companies and three days later, a clearing and settlement occurs. Well, m imagine if all of that were based on a distributed ledger. There would be no three day settlement period because the payment and the settlement would be the same activity. It's just a change to the database, real time. Payments. You have micro payments. You have a single version of the truth. You could have smart payments. You know the idea? Smart money. You send your kid off to university, you give him some money for spending on books and tuition, um, and, and you hope he doesn't use it in the bar. 
Well, with smart money, he goes into the bar, orders a caparina, and the money says, sorry, I don't do caparinas. I only do books and tuition. Um, so, and the idea behind that is something called a smart contract. These are some of these extraordinary new platforms that are now uh, coming out. And a smart contract is just like what it sounds like. It's, it's a, an agreement that's made of software. It self-executes, <clears throat> polices itself. And so when certain conditions are met, then certain things happen, like somebody gets paid. So Dilbert is now involved. <laughs> um, and um, you know when Dilbert starts talking about something, it's, it's kind of gone pretty mainstream. So I've not always been lucky with the timing of my books, but I got lucky with this one. I also got lucky with my co-author, who turns out <laughs> is uh, smarter than me, and he's also a better writer. But uh, uh, this is the big book on blockchain. Our publisher just said it's probably sold more copies than all other books combined. And it's not in 26 languages like economics, but it's getting there. It's in 19 languages now. And uh, if you're wondering how to get the book, the best way is in massive volume. <laughs> Christmas, it's coming soon. You look like people with friends. Do you have loved ones? No, seriously, I'm very proud of this book. Now at this point, I would normally give a one half hour discussion of what this stuff does and how it changes the nature of the firm, the architecture of the corporation, how it's beginning to disrupt uh, a whole series of different industries, the opportunities for using blockchain in government, how it could be used to help us solve this growing crisis of legitimacy uh, in democracy, how it could deal with things like, like uh, uh, all the incorrect information that is floating around these days. Uh, but I'm not going to do any of that. But if you want to talk about that at the end, I'd be happy to do that. Pick any industry or any problem you think that we have in society, and we can talk about our business, and we can talk about how blockchain might help. Um, but I'm going to kind of ask for a leap of uh, faith here and ask you to believe that this is really a big deal. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. A $50 trillion industry is the supply chain industry. FedEx, one of our uh, partners at the Blockchain Research Institute, the CEO um, of FedEx Logistics, Richard Smith, says we're, we invented the chain of custody uh, idea and we're going to rebuild it around blockchain and we're starting by rebuilding a whole new logistics industry. Um, imagine you got trains and boats and planes and trucks and borders and tax authorities and governments and, and invoices and bills of lading and shipping uh, documents. <laughs> they told us in FedEx, the way you know what's in a railway car is there's a little envelope up inside the car that's got a piece of paper in it saying what's in the car. All this stuff is moving around with paper and emails and faxes and, and primitive data. Imagine if you had a shared network state where you could see real time everything that's happening. And when something changed, it was real time. So that's a $50 trillion industry. Uh, that's kind of... Uh, kind of a big deal. And there are many, many other, every industry, there are really exciting changes in applications. And a lot of them have to do with blockchain for good as well. Has anyone here seen my TED talk? A um, few people? Yeah, the, uh, I go into a bunch of opportunities using blockchain for good. 70% of the land titles in the developing world are not enforceable. You're in Honduras. A dictator comes to power, he says, you may have a piece of paper that says you own your little farm, but the government central computer says, my friend owns your farm. This happened on a mass scale. Eventually, he was ousted. But this is a huge problem all around the world. You put a land title on a blockchain, and nobody can mess with that unless they know how to turn a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. No, sorry, I can't restrain myself on that analogy. 
But, um, you know, these two billion people in the global economy that are not banked and don't have access to financial services, half of them have a supercomputer in their pocket. So, Mukesh Ambani, chairman of Reliance Industries in India, 300 million users on his mobile network, he's implementing blockchain as a service. So all those people will instantly have the ability to, to do transactions, to buy things, to do banking, and so on. So there's some very, very powerful and exciting opportunities. Now, um, we've been trying to figure out, well, how do you do this? Your community, your, I don't know, your Texas, your Dallas, uh, and um, you want to be the global center for the second era of the digital age like Silicon Valley was for the first. And these are the countries that are doing uh, quite well. These are our top five right now. And rather than talking theoretically about what it takes to do this, I thought I would just describe Canada, and in particular the ecosystem around where I live and what's being done there, to see if there's a lot of great things being done here too, to see if you can learn from it. These are some of the variables that we use to analyze whether or not a region or a country is doing well in building up uh, an ecosystem. And right now, the top one in the United States is actually New York, of all things, according to our analysis. So let me just go through these, and, and we'll talk about uh, Canada. And, and uh, what I'm going to describe is the results. First of all, we did this thing called the Blockchain Corridor, uh, where the federal government asked us at the Blockchain Research Institute to explore this idea could Canada become a global center for all of this? And then just on Friday, we published something called the Canadian Blockchain Census. Wow, would that be cool, the Texas Blockchain Census. Do that here. And, uh, and we at attempted to just map out this ecosystem. How big is it? How much do people get paid? Um, uh, uh, what kind of entrepreneurial activity is there around this? Uh, what are the banks doing? Um, you know, what are the main obstacles and impediments to going forward, of which there are some significant ones? And um, this is kind of what we came up with. So Canada is very fortunate. We have these five banks, uh, main banks, and uh, they're not 150, they're five. And so they can actually cooperate together in a reasonable way. Now, in the U.S., you have a very different thing. You have uh, companies like J.P. Morgan that are probably investing as much as all of five of these combined, although the, these five banks are all in the top 15 banks in North America now. And that happened after 2008. RBC went from number 22 to number three in terms of assets. Um, and, and, and these banks didn't get affected by the crisis so much, in part because you just... The, the structure of the mortgage market is very different in Canada. You just can't do the kind of things that, that happen on Wall Street. But that's a positive thing, and these banks are each investing, I would say, hundreds of millions of dollars in fintech, and blockchain's a big part of it. There are great universities, University of Waterloo for computer science and uh, many others. Uh, Canada's very fortunate to have some big incubators, and some of the largest in the world. And there, there's a process that I can tell you about that's not huge, but it's very influential, called the Creative Destruction Lab, and it's based at the University of Toronto. It's basically Shark Tank, only but the real thing, without TV cameras in the room. And every quarter, they bring in another 20 c companies, and these companies have all qualified to be in the room with a bunch of big investors. And uh, the companies each meet with experts, including uh, faculty and graduate students at the University of Toronto, and they are given assignments. By, uh, by the end of the next quarter, you gotta hire a CMO and you gotta get your back office IT together. 
And if the company does that, they get to stay in the group. And if they stay in the group, then people are going to invest in them. And it started off being an AI stream, but there's now a big stream on blockchain. And this Creative Destruction Lab has been taken to Silicon Valley, but it's the kind of thing that would be a really good idea to have here. And they happily talk to uh, uh, UT Dallas about doing something like that. Or you could do a similar thing. Um, there's no, no big proprietary um, uh, IP here. It's just a, it's a process and a method. The biggest actual incubation center in the world is Mars. It's got uh, two million square feet, and that's in Toronto. So that's a good thing. Um, there are a lot of entrepreneurs. You'd have your own list here in Dallas. But most of these are real going con uh, concerns, um, sort of really hot uh, companies that are doing uh, well. We have this guy, Vitalik, who invented Ethereum, but the regula regulatory environment in Canada didn't let him do his token offering in Canada, uh, prevented him, so he took it to Switzerland. Um, there are companies, big companies implementing it. It's very important. You need companies to be using this technology too. And uh, so linking up entrepreneurs with uh, uh, large companies in the area uh, is critical. This is a really exciting thing um, that it used to be you had angel investment, venture capital, then you could, um, the VCs would do something bigger, maybe like a Series A or something like that. But what happened in, in Canada was you get to the point where you have $20 million in revenue, you want to raise uh, $15 million to, to take your business to the next stage. Sequoia will give you the money, but they'll say you have to move to Silicon Valley. So Canada had this big, it wasn't just a brain drain, it was a company drain, that all these companies got to be a certain size and they'd all leave the country. Now this problem could be solved through this thing called ICOs. It's a terrible name, it stands for Initial Coin Offering. Um, and it's essentially a crowdfunding campaign on a blockchain. The reason it's not a good name is because you're raising, you're selling a token. And this token represents an asset of some kind. Now, it could represent a share in a company, or a, if not a formal share, a piece of ownership of a company. But it, there are all kinds of other things that it could represent. Uh, you have utility tokens that enable a smart contract to work. There are things like uh, natural asset tokens that could represent a barrel of oil or a synthetic asset, like a carbon credit. You have um, tokens that represent a currency, like, like Bitcoin. There are tokens that represent something you could call a stable coin that's pegged to a fiat currency, like the, uh, like the US dollar. And so, um, and that of course is what Facebook is talking about doing too. That kind of woke up the world a bit. Facebook going to create a global currency. Um, they would instantly become the largest retail bank in the world by two orders of magnitude, 2.5 billion customers. They would wipe out Western Union's remittance business, which is a huge part of Western Union's revenue. Um, and if they could pull that off, it'd be a huge thing. Now, it's a big if. But uh, anyway, this is... This is a way of raising funding. And if you can get a good regulatory environment where you can do this kind of stuff in a way that not only protects investors, but helps encourage innovation too. Because regulators are not there just to protect investors. They're there to get that balance right so that you can grow an innovation economy. Unfortunately, in both Canada and the United States, this is a, this is a challenge. Um, there's a sort of good regulatory environment. I shouldn't have said good. I should have said sort of good um, in, in Canada. And, uh, you know, re regulators, they look at a token, they say, that's a security. You know, it may look like a duck, uh, but it doesn't walk like a duck. It sort of swims like a dolphin. And, uh, 
It doesn't talk like a duck, it talks like a small motor vehicle. Uh, but they can't wrap their head around the fact that, that that's all, only going to be a duck. So um, that was one mixed metaphor. I never tried that, but it just came out. Um, but, and there's a, unfortunately, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, governments are playing um, a big role in Canada, less likely to happen in the U.S., but the federal government has put a billion dollars into something called innovation clusters. There are five of them, and they're about a couple hundred million dollars each to build a big cluster. But if you can get governments, you don't want governments bet and taking bets on technology, but there are a lot of things that governments can do. One of the most important things that governments can do is to be a model user just to use the technology themselves. And in doing so, they'll reduce costs and be able to deliver better services. Um, this, is, this is not a political statement. I'm not a political person. But uh, what, what happened was, it's sort of an interesting thing that a lot of, these are mainly Canadian expats, so we're living in the US. And the environment, they decided the political environment is such, or they had immigration problems or something um, that have arisen in the last few years, and they've ended up coming home. So that's been a positive uh, thing, because you need talent. And that's so important, and that's where the universities <laughs> come in, too. And then it's good to have thought leadership. Um, uh, Dallas has one thing that no other city in the United States has, it has a university that is fully plugged into the Blockchain Research Institute and has access to all of our intellectual property. And uh, we're in discussions um, uh, with, with UT Dallas about how to make that uh, more broadly available. We're the largest uh, think tank doing research in this area. We've done almost $10 million of work, 110 projects about blockchain opportunities. And any university can join this, but we have a special partnership with UT Dallas. So you put all that together, and you've got what you would describe as an ecosystem. And you might want to just spend a little bit of time thinking about, well, what's our ecosystem look like here? OK, let me wrap up with, uh, all is not well, though. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it's not perfect in Canada. And what we found out in the, the blockchain census, um, and just Google Canada blockchain census, and you'll come up with the report, is, um, is that um, there are some problems. Number one is a regulatory environment. Number two, a problem that you don't have here, is there's still some problems with funding in Canada. Angel invest, investments have never been great probably because there aren't that many rich people, um, or at least willing to invest. There are lots of rich people in, um, in the United Arab Emirates, but the idea of investing in a startup is unthinkable over there. Um, well, in some countries, they don't even have a limited liability corporation, so it's hard to talk about entrepreneurship when you're going to go to jail if you don't pay a bill. Um, but. And Canada, the venture capital environment's always been kind of weak. You have money here, and that's a huge uh, advantage. And then the final, um, final one is just lack of, uh, we're actually short on talent, notwithstanding all the great uh, universities and so on. And young people, there, there's tons of uh, AI courses in uh, computer science, but the whole um, academic environment is not yet plugged into uh, blockchain. So I'm going to end with one other uh, thought here, which is, how do you achieve uh, governance? So the, the way that we govern resources like this has really changed quite a bit. If you think about governing global problems, um, our model goes back to Bretton Woods after the Second World War, where all the winners, 44 countries, got together and created the IMF and the World Bank, and then uh, a year later, um, the United Nations, a broader group, and, and the, eventually the GATT and the WTO, global institutions based on nation states. Well, increasingly, we don't govern like this in the world because the private sector has become involved, and also you have the civil society. There, was no, there were no NGOs at Bretton Woods in 1944 because there weren't any. 
There were like 50 NGOs in the world. Now they're, what, 10% of the economy in Texas, probably. So um, when you think about a resource like the internet itself, it's not governed by the UN or the ITU or anything like that. It's governed by an ecosystem that involves standards groups like the ITF, it involves knowledge networks like the Internet Society, advocacy groups like the Electronic Frontier uh, Foundation. You've got um, network institutions, complex uh, and networks like the World Economic Forum that are involved uh, in stuff like this. And you put them all together and they govern the Internet. Well, we need to govern blockchain. But blockchain is more complicated, and, and uh, I just wanted to make this one point. Because you're governing the platform, so Ethereum needs a network to govern this. You're trying to govern overall in society in the sense that you need uh, advocacy groups, you need research groups, you need people trying to, um, uh, you need a trade association like the the Chamber of Digital Commerce to help get good legislation. And then in the middle, in Dallas, you got to build ecosystems that come together and do certain things. So I'll just give you an example of that. And I'm off to Memphis next week to meet with FedEx. They are building an ecosystem to rebuild the logistics industry that involves all of their suppliers, that involves um, uh, some uh, government organizations, and it involves their competitors. I chaired a panel of executives from FedEx, UPS, and DHL, all sitting there on the same stage. And my opening question was, how did you guys get here? Like, normally you'd want to kill each other if you got this close, wouldn't you? And they said, absolutely. But the only way we can rebuild the the logistics industry is to build an ecosystem at the application level. So that's something that's going to be of growing importance here as well. So I think that's about it. Um, I'll just say a word about us. Uh, if you're a university or a big co uh, company, or if you're an individual through UT uh, Dallas, you can get access to a lot of this. Um, but we're trying to bridge the gap between the opportunity and, and uh, the actual uh, deployment. And over the last three years, uh, we conducted 60 projects funded by 50 large companies. And the focus was on use cases. And now we're shifting more uh, to a focus on making it happen. One thing we're doing is also launching a series of large public events. <laughs> And uh, we'd welcome you to come to Toronto April 7th and 8th next year for Blockchain Revolution Global. It's about blockchain in the enterprise. We had um, 1,200 uh, executives from uh, 20 countries, 150 sessions. If you wanted to do one in Dallas, we could talk. Create Dallas as the global center for enterprise blockchain. Uh, events. <laughs> well, I'm speaking the region. Am I in trouble here? I'm staying in Frisco. The mayor of Frisco is my friend. Um, and, um, and then one thing you can do, I know a few of you in the room have done this because you came up to me and told me. Um, we spent close to a million dollars developing four full courses uh, um, with Coursera, and INSEAD was our academic partner for that in France. And um, this has like 250 tests, there are 200 videos, it's a massive undertaking. And the final course is a practicum where you need to figure out a use case in your industry. And if um, this is Blockchain 101, if you want to get into it anymore, and it's not super technical, it's a bu for business managers and execs, then do take the course, practically free. It costs like 79 bucks or something like that. So let me close in with this thought. This is about leadership. And when you get a new paradigm, vested interests fight against change. Ken Olson from Digital Equipment Corporation in the 80s, who said there's no reason why anyone would want to have a computer in their house. 
uh, famous last words. And leaders of old paradigms have difficulty embracing the new. How do we find leadership in a community to bring about a change like this? You have self-selected as leaders by coming to this event, and that's a wonderful thing. And leadership can come from anywhere. You know, sometimes it comes from the top. That's rare. Typically, it comes from other places within an organization or in a community. And um, leadership is each of our personal opportunity if we will it. And as we move into this more decentralized and distributed world, I think that that will be uh, even truer. Um, can you do it? Well, you sort of already are. You're on a great trajectory from what I can see. And, you know, I'm of the view that the future, I don't know, it's not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. And uh, it's, we're in an early stage in this whole thing, and you can achieve any future you want if you just find the leadership uh, within you to do that. I wasn't going to do this, but I think I will. I'd like to end with a metaphor uh, about building an ecosystem. And um, Alex and I have been studying nature <laughs> to try and learn more about distributed systems. And fish come in schools, bees come in swarms. Starlings over the moors of England, some other places, come in something called a murmuration. Have you heard this word, murmuration? It, it's a word, it's in the dictionary. It's what starlings come in. And um, the starlings are out over a 20 mile radius throughout the day, foraging for food, and doing their starling thing. At night, they come together and they create one of the most spectacular things in nature. And the murmuration has some functions. It warms the birds up for the cold night ahead and other things. But the main was it, it, it protects the birds from predators. See in the right of the screen there? That's a hawk, 25 times the size of a starling, a killer of starlings being chased away by the collective power of the little birds. And scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. And there's leadership, but there's no one leader. Um, and when the moment is right, this magic kind of happens. So is this some sort of fanciful analogy or might you actually learn something from it? Well, the murmuration functions according to our seven principles of the trust protocol. We talk about implicit my talk. We talk about in the book. That, remember I said, trust is not achieved by a middleman, it's achieved through collaboration and through some clever code. There is code in the DNA of the birds that gives us some rules, the big one being don't bump into anybody else. Um, but there are other rules too, like don't get too far away. And the murmuration also has a great interdependence. Incentives are all aligned. <laughs> and you know, if I'm speaking to a CEO, uh, audience, I'll say, I don't think business can succeed in a world that's failing. And we have growing problems in the world that we need, as business people, we need to care about and address so that our interests are connected to the other interests, so that a rising tide can lift all boats. And the same is true here. The bird functions as if its interest is connected to the murmuration as a whole, and vice versa. Another principle is integrity. And this thing functions with a great, what I would call integrity. And that's very important because it, that's the foundation of trust. You know, think about it. What is trust? Trust protocol. What is trust? Now, it took me two uh, months to write this sentence, okay? Trust is the expectation that the other party will act with integrity. Trust is the expectation that the other party will act with integrity, that they'll do the right thing, that they'll be honest, that they'll care, be considerate of your interests, your negotiation, that it's not just all about them winning, and that they abide by their commitments, which is why a little bird will 
chase after a predator 25 times its size because it knows that the other birds will do the right thing. But they will, in a sense, act with integrity. So this is a stimulus response kind of thing. There's no cognition here. But imagine if we layer on some human cognition, what could we do with that? You know, I, I get pretty uh, excited every time I see that thing that maybe if we do this, um, this sort of smaller, more distributed world that our grandchildren might inherit could actually be a better one. I'll just end it there. Thanks. Well, asking a question after that is going to feel really dumb. Um, my, uh, thank you so much. That was a great talk. And I, I, the only way I can think of to paraphrase it, it seems like blockchain is that old quote of nothing's more powerful than an idea whose time has come. So my question for you is, what's the killer app that's going to make everyone, my mom, her hairdresser, <laughs> be as involved as those same people were back in early not in early 90s, buying a computer because they want to be on the internet yeah. and didn't, have, didn't really know what they were going to do with it, and now their entire life is around it. Yeah. How, do you, how do you see that as being the first killer app that's going to make that happen? Well, there is one, um, which I'll describe in a second. But before I do that, it depends on who you are. You know, if you're a housekeeper and you're getting charged 15% to send money to your mom, um, and you can do it not in seven days, but in seven minutes, and get charged 1%. That's kind of cool. Um, if you own a little farm in India, and you don't have a valid land title, you could have one. That's a big deal. If you're one of the billion people who are going to be brought on into the global financial system through blockchain, that's a really important <laughs> material thing. Way more material than the ability to, to go onto the web and surf for something, actually, in terms of the immediate impact in your life. But the, the biggest ones, to me, have to do with uh, data and our identities, I think. And it's going to take a while for this to evolve. And I think it's going to start in healthcare. So. Uh, there's nobody here from MD Anderson in Houston, by any chance, is there? No. Um, because, um, yeah, anyway, let me, let me back up a bit. Um, th there's a big problem that has to do with data, and it's reflected in the patient record, but it's reflected in data in general. Sorry, what's your first name again? Siddharth. Siddharth. OK, we were talking before. Um, Siddharth is creating a mirror image of himself online as he goes throughout life, the virtual Siddharth. And the virtual Siddharth knows more about him than he does in all kinds of areas. He can't remember what he bought a year ago or said a year ago or his exact location a year ago or what, what medication he took or what diagnosis he had or what he got on a test or, you know, I could say about 500 examples of that. And he creates it but it's not owned by him. And the term that I used to describe this, and it may be a little hyperbolic, sorry, is it's sort of a digital feudalism. That under the feudal system that predated capitalism and democracy all around the world, um, you weren't paid a wage. You were tied to some land. And you created value on that land. You grew some produce. The landlord took away most of it, and you got to keep a little bit. Well, today, Siddharth creates all this value, but most of it is expropriated by big organizations, by social media companies, by Google and big banks and so on, and he's left with a few cabbages. And that means that he, there are four problems with that. One is these systems that the landlord owns can be hacked, and his security is vulnerable. Number two, uh, he can't use that data to plan his life, his health, his education, whatever. Number three, he can't monetize it. It's being monetized by Facebook and Google and others, and they're creating the most powerful corporations ever, richest companies ever. 
And there's a big one that his privacy is being undermined too. And people who say, well, I've had this at Davos, you know, last year. Don, privacy's dead. Get over it. Um, mm. If you've got nothing to hide, what's your problem? I think this is foolishness. Privacy is the foundation of freedom. You want a little taste of that? Do you know about the social score in China? You don't pay a parking ticket and things start to happen in your life. And, and God forbid you go on a demonstration, you end up losing your passport, your kid doesn't get into a good school, or all of a sudden you're in jail or something. Oh, oh you got that dream job, all the interviews went perfect. Just, uh, whoop, there was a problem with your reference check. You don't get the job. You have no idea why. So, and that's a big brother, but the problem, and the government, but the problem, and we assume that governments are always benevolent, right? I'm not sure that's a good assumption. Um, but then there's little brother, too, all these huge companies that have the kind of data on, it, on us that's absolutely unbelievable. I forget his name. The guy who wrote Sapiens. Um, yeah, well, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, he did a talk at Davos last year. It was terrifying. He says the kind of data that, that companies will have on us is extraordinary. He says, I'm gay. He says, I didn't know I was gay till I was 19, but if you have perfect data on my body, which they will have real time, you know, emotional responses and so on, you can know I'm gay like 10 years before I do. <laughs> so, um, and he says, and that's just the beginning because your epigenetics, all the protein that surrounds your genes, that's just chemistry. You can change the way your genes work by doing chemical things to your body. He says, the privacy is not just that people have information about you. This is all software. We can, ultimately, <laughs> there are these crazy dangers that Orwellian never dreamed of that people could, and companies could reprogram us to behave better or differently. So that's a real far-fetched one, but I'm, I'm much more parochial right now. This is, a, this is a challenge. So this is a really long answer to a short question. <laughs> I'm going to always go that way. Yeah. <laughs> In psychological terms, it's called punishment. It tends to extinguish yeah. question asking behavior. Um, that was all a preamble for the point I wanted to make. Killer app, uh, digital identity. Your identity is in a blockchain, in a black box, and it moves around with you and it sweeps up all this transactional data and your heart rate, your, you know, and every, your location and everything else, and you own it. So at the University Health Network in Toronto, um, it's ranked the number seven hospital in the world. Uh, the US has two, uh, 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 Mayo Clinic and Sloan Kettering. There's one in Canada, amazingly. Anyway, they're implementing a blockchain-based patient identity. And already, you get an x-ray, and before you leave the hospital, your radiology report is in your identity. And as this moves to a blockchain, you own it. And you can do whatever you like with it. Get a second opinion. Anonymize it and give it to science. Uh, anonymize it and sell it. Um, whatever you want, and they're very insistent that your identity should be owned by you, and your healthcare record should be owned by you. Now the goal, of course, is to start to bundle all kinds of other data into that, and to create a self-sovereign identity. To me, if we don't do this as societies, uh, this is a very big, big problem. Because this data is created by us, and the solutions on how to solve this problem are terrible. Governments should protect us. The GDPR in Europe. Well, maybe there's a role for governments. The big companies should give us access to our data. I don't want access only. I want to own it. I created it. Why don't I own it? I want, I want to own all of my cabbages <laughs> and all the other vegetables I grew, too. So uh, this is a very, very exciting thing for me. If I write another book, this is going to be the topic. Thank you. I promise. 20 seconds. You, uh, you made several comments about the security of blockchain. 
An internet search, can blockchain be hacked, turns up many events. There's even a top 25 successful hacks, millions of Bitcoin uh, hacked. Would you talk a little bit about the vulnerabilities yeah. and the emerging security measures that are uh, going to evolve with that? Yeah, and the hack is not a Bitcoin, because good luck hacking Bitcoin. The hack, for all the reasons I said, the hack is organizations built on top of Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, and a, and a big one is exchanges. If you create an exchange, okay, thanks. If you create an exchange on Bitcoin, it should be a distributed exchange, not a, a centralized exchange. I mean, this horrific thing in Canada where there was an exchange and nobody knew but the founder of the exchange had a single password to control everything and he went to India and died, taking the password to his grave. And either that or he's in an ashram having a hell of a good time with a new identity. Um, but so this is absolutely buyer beware. I wouldn't keep my money in an exchange, although there are now exchanges that that have cold storage. So your your uh, your crypto and your keys to your crypto are actually stored in a place that's not on a network. And so no one can, can hack unless they physically uh, get into it. Uh, but this is something where if you're gonna invest in this space, for sure you wanna be sophisticated because things can be hacked that use blockchain technology. Thanks. I think we've got two questions and then we're gonna get done. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to say that was a really good presentation. The analogy at the end was better than the first one. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, um, I know you said you didn't want to get into politics, but blockchain's available globally. Which country do you think is excelling at applying blockchain to emerging technologies like you know, autonomous vehicles, AI, et cetera? Is it America or China? And do you think in the future it would be used as a geopolitical leverage point the same way 5G is fought over between China and America? Wow. Um, short, short answer, uh, that's a challenge. So um, I gave the top five countries, but it's a little more complicated than that because China, for example, President Xi, I was there and he, he introduced me through a statement at a big conference I was speaking at and he said two technologies for China, AI and blockchain, driving us forward. The president of China said that. Uh, I can't imagine the president of hardly any other country saying that. And they're investing billions of dollars. Uh, this one region um, um, in China where the local state is investing a billion dollars a year in building a blockchain ecosystem. Having said that, China has banned cryptocurrencies, pretty much, exchanges, and um, there's mining in China, but even that is under great duress. And they've also banned uh, token offerings, initial coin offerings and other token generation events. And that's a big problem because it prevents Chinese entrepreneurs from having this extraordinary way of raising money. So it's a very uneven thing. And then if you think about the applications in China too, well, one belt, one road, this is the biggest supply chain in the world. It's a trillion dollars and linking Hong Kong and Rotterdam. It's the new Silk Road. China's driving it, there are 22 countries involved. Cynics say it's for them to dominate Asia and most of Europe. Uh, but all the trade finance on that is being done on blockchain. And we sent a team uh, over there to, to research it and they wrote uh, a report which is now publicly available at, um, uh, at the blockchainresearchinstitute.org site. But um, on the other hand, you think about that, just that discussion that I just had about identity. China is not going to issue a self-sovereign identity for citizens to protect their privacy and where they can monetize their own data. That ain't going to happen. So these social and political factors do interfere with the ability of a country to move forward. So 
it's going to be really une uh, uh, uneven, uneven and combined development to watch how this whole thing plays out around the world. Now, China and Japan, am I predicting this? There's a high probability in 2020 that both of them will uh, adopt a uh, blockchain for their fiat currency. You're not all, you won't be buying your you know, McDonald's or, or your house using Bitcoin in Texas. You're going to use the U.S. dollar, but the U.S. dollar will become a cryptocurrency, and that would give the Fed huge power in a country like the U.S. to do good things, to uh, you, you change the inflation rate, you can see what happens. People spending more, uh, they're, they're investing more, they're saving more, they're, you know, whatever. Uh, you have a crisis like 2008, rather than giving the money to the banks, billions and billions of dollars to, to, to you could helicopter drop those funds onto the, the devices of the population or the poorest third of, uh, of people in America. Or, or, or something like that. You could have a much lighter touch on regulation because you could have transparency that it, you could see a lot better what's going on uh, in the economy. So um, uh, I did a, a private session for all the uh, for all the central bankers and ministers of finance who are at Davos, and uh, we had a big talk about this. And I said. We should just do this. And no one in the room said, this is a stupid idea. It's all, yeah, how do we do it? And what are all the implementation challenges? So if China does that, now, of course, they're going to use blockchain to know what individuals are doing with their money. Um, it will be very helpful for the economy. I'm not sure it's going to be that great for your average Chinese citizen, though. Two quick ones. Um, my son who's involved in an AI startup sent me an article recently about uh, the Russians uh, launching a malware attack on the Ukrainians uh, in 2015, and that thing spreading around the world and doing about $10 billion worth of damage. And I was just wondering if blockchain has a hope of, you know, preventing that kind of, you know, malicious behavior by, you know, bad actors in the world. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's kind of a vignette of a whole bunch of questions around that. And I'll tell you my view, is that technology doesn't solve problems. Humans do. And there are bad actors. Criminals are always the first to adopt exciting new technologies. But then you have, you know, states that are borderline criminal as, as well. Um, but what it does do is, is the Internet of Information was a wonderful thing, but it, it did cause a whole bunch of problems. I mean, and, and this is humbling for me to admit that. When I wrote Digital Economy, I said, I think the Internet's going to bring us all together because we'll all have access to the same information. I said the opposite could happen. We could follow our own information and point of view and end up in these self-reinforcing echo chambers where the purpose of information is not to inform, but it's, I don't know, to give us comfort for our preconceived ideas. Apparently, in some countries, like you've got 20% of the population who think vaccinations are a bad idea. An epidemiologist at Davos last year was saying, we're going to need another plague before people understand that this is actually an important thing. So there's all the uh, people denying science and all kinds of, uh, 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 yeah, of, of issues. So, um, so to, to answer the question, uh, bad information, this is a really exciting opportunity for blockchain because you see a fact or it's presented as a fact by, by anybody, not just you know, the New York Times, but maybe by the president or maybe by anyone who says this is true, you can um, ultimately, if we move to a blockchain-based media environment, which should occur, you'll be able to look at the provenance of that. And you'll be able to go back and know that it, you know, came from a reputable source or it came from a, um, one of these organizations that's in the business of generating, you know, c conspiracy theories or 
or, or something else like that. So there's a lot of discussion about blockchain and fake news and how it could help us uh, overcome these problems. Ultimately, it's a set of tools, and I just hope that there's more good guys and bad guys, uh, honestly, and that we'll, that we'll use this stuff uh, for the good. But it, jury's out. Yeah. Hey, Don. So last question real quick. And one of my favorite topics, um, as you know, there are competing protocols. You've got an IOTA Tangle, home to North Texas. You've got a Hedera Hashgraph. Um, is blockchain the winning brand, or is it the winning protocol? And will there be more than one? Whoa, great question. <laughs> uh, it's the winning um, root protocol. Um, but based on that, there are all kinds of protocols that represent different blockchains. And in one way, do you remember early, mid-1990s, companies said, well, we're not using that internet because that's the Wild West and it's full of porn and criminals and all kinds of bad stuff. We're going to create an intranet, a private internet within our company. And then over time, these intranets tended to sort of go away and companies found ways to sort of securely use the public uh, internet. And there will be a public blockchain or a network of blockchains. One of those companies I mentioned, Cosmos, is creating an internet of blockchains so that they will interact. They're supposed to announce that. Uh, the, they exist today, it's a protocol, but they're supposed to announce that capability in the first quarter of next year. But unlike the Internet of Information, uh, blockchain's about value, and there's some categories of value where you do want it to be private and proprietary. If you're a bank, you're going to use a blockchain. You want to restrict it to your customers, for example. Um, so. You know, if you're the U.S. federal government, you're holding an election on a blockchain, which is, by the way, the only way you'll ever vote online. Nobody's going to vote online unless they have cryptographic proof that the double spend problem has been solved, right? You know, the uh, Cleveland uh, uh, Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, held a, a big vote on who is the greatest band of all time, and Chicago had 800 million votes, the man uh, Chicago. Well, there's no way 800 million people in the world have listened to the man Chicago. Um, so that, then they move towards the blockchain where you know that you, know, you have cryptographic proof that people can't vote again. And, and as a voter, you know that the government can't move your vote to somebody else or it, you know, it, it's a secure vote. So, but that would be a, a very, proprietary system to conduct an election that would not be available uh, to anyone. It would be available to uh, uh, certified citizens of the United States. So it's a great talk, and we could go. I'll say one more thing about this. Um, unlike the Internet of Information, where the protocols were uh, public, and they were not owned by anybody, thanks to Vint Cerf with the Internet, Tim Berners-Lee with the World Wide Web. The Internet of Value, many of the basic protocols will be owned by investors. And so people who say, well, this is all fluff, and Bitcoin's just a big pyramid scheme and it's all going to crash. Well, I can't speak to Bitcoin, but one or more of these platforms will emerge as the brand and the, the set of protocols either that bring things together or that, um, or that dominate the, the market for certain classes like enterprise, uh, blockchain, and so on. And investors have an opportunity to buy into that. So uh, what's the internet of information worth? I don't know. Trillion dollars, 10 trillion, 50 trillion, a lot. Well, if it's true what I'm saying that the internet of value is going to be even bigger, then you get to buy into it now. Now, I'm not suggesting you all go out and buy a bunch of crypto, and that's the last thing in the world I'd do. But it is a counter argument to those people who say that this is all just vaporware.
Thank you Thank so much. You. We really appreciate it. We all learned a great deal. We want to thank Ron Patterson from the Frisco EDC. He had to leave early. Uh, we thank Lori from Mayor Cheney's office and everyone here at Inspire Frisco. Thanks you for coming, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you so much.